A people searching for their path. A world getting ever closer. A celebration of a miracle. Hopefully, it's also the beginning of something more exciting to come. World Insights Special on China at its 70th anniversary. Many faces and voices. A collective memory. A world in the making. And welcome to Insight China on the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. I'm Tian Wei. Any moment of the past seven decades in China was unprecedented in human history. Many from different parts of the world have witnessed those moments and have been telling those stories from their vantage point. Yet rarely has anyone left his or her mark like the one we are about to meet today, who with ultimate curiosity and sincerity and generosity has bounded his life with that of China's, especially over the past 40 years. Wen Sik started his entangled life with China as a businessman who tested the waters at the very beginning of the country's reform and opening up by establishing the first industrial joint venture between China and the West. Later, as Swiss ambassador to China, he laid the foundation of business exchanges between the two countries. Over the years, he became the biggest collector of Chinese contemporary art in the world. Through that collection, he chronologically saved the most recent memories of China's pain and happiness. He has left his marks on China, while China and the Chinese have enriched his life, unimaginable as it is today. It's a clear day and uh, the air is quite good. Beijing Unlike most been. people think, you know, <laughs> the air 40 years ago wasn't really such a clear air because, mm. particularly in winter, everyone would heat with this coal, run coal bricks, yes. cook, and uh, that actually also didn't exactly clear the air at the time. I can see you remember all the details of life in China 40 years ago. Uh, I don't remember clearly because mm. much of the silhouette remains same, but the facades were yeah. all newly made. Huh? Yeah. So, well, how did they look like? I don't really know, but I think the shapes are there. Not far from here, Tiananmen Square, over there. That's where the 70th anniversary celebrations central place of it. I'm sure you've seen some of these political events in China too. I have seen many, and of course I was here very often, first of October, big parades at the time, and uh, the big portraits rolled out of uh, the big uh, communist figures, and uh, yeah, I saw a lot of changes. Uh, <laughs> 35th anniversary, that was a big time, 1984, 40s, yearly, mm -hmm. they had celebrated on these days, Olympic Games, Olympic Games also for me very important point in time because uh, I actually brought the people who built the bird's nest That's in Beijing nice. and uh, I negotiated their contract. The games were, uh, are awarded to the city of Beijing. Were you in Beijing when the announcement was made that Beijing will got the 2008 happen, Olympic Games. I happened to be really? in Beijing at that <laughs> day. The streets are so uh, crowded by people. Were you with them? I, I was also standing out there, yes, with friends. I remember vividly that particular night.
Was it a good moment for you, though? Of course, a good moment. Uh, um, yet, I didn't know, you know, there would be something like the bird's nest, which was an important step also in my life, yeah. you know, um, well, make it realize. Wen Li Sika in the Beijing Hotel, where he stayed 40 years ago as one of the few foreigners coming to Beijing. Overlooking the Chang'an Avenue, the hotel is one of the very few foreigners were allowed to stay then. I managed to schedule a coffee with him right inside the hotel, the exact place where he negotiated his first deal in China, the establishment of the first ever industrial joint venture between China and the West, the China Schindler Elevator Company. Nice hotel. Changed. 1970s, it was different. Very different. There, I remember actually in this hotel a moment where uh, the Chinese said that, you know, that's it. Uh, I mean, your proposal just not good enough. You know. uh, let's stop here. You know, we go home, basically. And we were in a kind of crisis mode. When was that? It was at the very beginning, in the at middle the of it? At the beginning, like end of 79 something and uh, then we had a group I was the youngest in our team as well which also was very unusual for the Chinese side to see you know all of a sudden me as the youngest took charge of the negotiation because in this deep crisis I had uh, an idea how we could have a comeback mm -hmm. into the negotiation <laughs> So I asked the Chinese, have one more opportunity next day, and I prepared with the team the presentation, which then, you know, made the Chinese change their mind. They said, oh, okay, then, yeah, let's go on. Uh, so that night was a very difficult night, because uh, it appeared that the whole case was lost. We had big controversy within our own group, but in the end, I was so happy someone had an, had an idea, my idea, as a youngest, so you know, they happily accepted. Nobody was doing the thing that you were exactly doing, which is trying to establish the first China foreign joint venture in China at that time. Uh, I was kind of very adventurous, and you know, this looked like uh, the only white spot that remained on the map of the global elevator industry, so <laughs> to put it. So, uh, of course, you were very excited to be here and try to do something no one ever had achieved. You know, what, what better could you find as a young man? Did you volunteer to be here? Uh, well, I was kind of thrown into it, but uh, I would have also volunteered, but, you know, it was kind of a specific situation in the group I was working at the time and no one knew exactly about China then no one knew exactly about this journalist me who had just you know started to work there so they said uh, you do China <laughs> <laughs> so what was the first time the negotiation like we gathered in one of these rooms here big room and uh, you know it was like 15 people minimum on the Chinese side we were a group of six seven people everything proceeded very slow huh? because had to be translated maybe the two translators our side their side you know had to kind of uh, agree on what this what really was what was the most difficult issue at the time in the negotiation? The most difficult issue was that China was a planned economy at the time and we were trying to set up an element from a market economy, some kind of semi-autonomous company, but no one had a clear view what the company is. And you know, at that time, in the plant economy, you had an elevator factory, and the elevator factory had a tonnage plan, what kind of output had to deliver. 
so on so many elevators, while what we were trying to achieve was, of course, a, a, an economy and a company where the output is denominated in money. That was already a first issue. And then there was no legal framework. It was not clear what the company really is. You know, does it have a board? Does it have a general assembly? Uh, who decides what? Mm -hmm. Do we get uh, shares? Do we get a receipt of some kind? We pay the money. Uh, everything was open. How to draw a profit and loss statement? How the company ought to be taxed? So we had to negotiate you know, how you do all this, how you arrive at the profit, wow. what the tax rate is. And that was, of course, also an advantage at the same time. And uh, I was very happy when I saw that some of the results of our negotiation turned into law. Mm. So uh, it was a true model uh, for not only China, but for many, many foreign companies, mm. how to invest in China. It was considered crazy at the time because the people in the West said, you bring money to China, you bring technology to China, you know, how come you do this? <laughs> So it, it was, yeah, and much of it happened in here. So how did the Chinese learn these ideas? I mean, they've never been in a market economy. They've never been doing businesses with so-called the capitalist countries. It was at the same time a kind of lecture and negotiation for both sides, you know, because we also had to be lectured. What are the issues in the plant economy and what in our, the no-goes, you know, when establishing this strange animal. Yeah. And we had to present our no-goes and yeah. we had to find this common ground. Very complicated because the planned economy, uh, you know, the pricing... It's a totally different idea. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. pricing said, yeah. you know, anything kind of arbitrarily. But we had to come to a sustainable enterprise which could live from its profits and so on and so on. What was the most important skill that you had, you think, really get it in a negotiation with the Chinese? Listening. You know, in the West, the people not used to listen. You may be interrupt in a conversation, you have a new thought, you know. But at that time, it was very important to listen. It could be very long. <laughs> that could be very long. So to me, the, the Chinese approach more like an artist approach. You know, a good artist with a painting mm -hmm. will start somewhere. May not know how it will come out, but a good artist has a confidence. It will be a good painting, even though not a clear idea. So while doing, you know, it shapes up. This is more also the Chinese business approach today, different from Western approach. Cross the river while groping the stones, as they say. So, how do you think your experiences of the joint venture, be the first one, be able to help you in your career path? Uh, well, one thing is the learning, you know, the learnings I drew from that, which is, you know, to remain very open, uh, to accept that maybe your defined path may not be the only one. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have to try from here. If it doesn't work, maybe you do this, maybe you do that. This has helped me a great deal later. And uh, of course you learn about a very different culture. China being the other for me dive into another culture as deeply as you had to hear, it makes you very much aware of your own culture by difference. And uh, it's also transformative. It uh, ideally <laughs> makes another better person uh, of yourself. A people searching for their path. A world getting ever closer. A celebration of a miracle. Hopefully, it's also the beginning of something more exciting to come. 
World Insights special on China at its 70th anniversary. Many faces and voices, a collective memory, a world in the making. But the speed really picked up in the past 40 years. This era has left both the country and the rest of the world wowed by the Chinese economic miracle. But beneath the surface of that, there has been constant challenges, pains, and struggles. While the country was in the fast lane, there was always a small group of people who chose to pause and capture the real essence. They are the contemporary Chinese artists. Willie Seeker knows this secret. He's put his heart and mind into building his bonds with these artists through their work. He took me to one of his favorite Beijing homes, 798. This is an art community compound which taps into the deepest poles of China through the art. It was a very organic process because I had this desire to learn more about China. I was totally ignorant when I came here and already in the early days I thought that art would provide me another access to Chinese reality mm -hmm. from what I would see as a business person. At that time I was looking and in fact I didn't think was so exciting. Mm -hmm. Why not? Uh, the paintings at that time, first exhibition called Star Exhibition, small oil paintings and uh, you would think looking with a western eye maybe it's painted 100 years too late. <laughs> Did you tell the artists? <laughs> no. <laughs> because they were not yet in the know what had happened in Western contemporary art and they did not have access yet to all the apparatus a Western artist would have like a video camera like uh, even a computer later you know all, all these things were out of the budget of most uh, artists. Who's the artist that you originally collected Actually, the first artist work uh, I collected. This artist disappeared from the scene, hmm. actually, soon afterwards. Interesting. That shows you the risk of uh, co collecting contemporary art anywhere. These artists may rise, they may fall, they may cease to do art. That's an example of someone who just disappeared. What is that work about? It's actually a work by a female artist. It's kind of flowery thing <laughs> and uh, yeah it's, uh, that was earliest work. You know what were some of those most well-known Chinese contemporary artists of the day now uh, like at that time for example Xu Bing. <laughs> Xu Bing is without a doubt one of the most important Chinese artists of his generation. When China finally opened its doors to the world Zhu Bing, already a well-regarded artist at that point, seized the opportunity to move to New York in 1990. Uh, he, of course, young man then, very original thinker. We met in the States. So, uh, of course, we talk about his work and uh, we talk about the, the situation of a Chinese artist you know, living in the Western world and uh, making his entry into the Western art world. What about Wang Guangyi? Well, he was, of course, living here, <laughs> and uh, he, well, had already a lot of self-confidence at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, he, you know, did not much care whether, uh, say, Western people would understand what he was doing, but actually, a Western audience could access his work very well, better than many other artists' works. <laughs> His avant-garde artworks and extraordinary commercial success led him to be renowned globally as an important contributor to the contemporary art scene. Huang, you know, he sort of brought like Chinese advertising and Western 
advertising on one surface. So that was also understandable to a Western person not so familiar with China. What about Feng Mengbo? This is the long march restart, 2008. Uh, he was the first, first artist in China owning a computer. Mm. <laughs> and uh, it, we, well, this cost in a small apartment about uh, his work. And he actually already started a communication with some software people in the West. And they were just uh, struck what he was able to do. They couldn't explain how he could you know, as an individual with just a small Apple computer, do these things he actually did. You brought him to Venice Biennale. It's almost like a come out party for the Chinese contemporary artists together with Mr. Harold Zeman. Well, Some say it's been too commercialized since then. Did you regret? Uh, of course not. You know, if uh, commercialized, then it, there is one privilege for artists. They make a better living. But uh, I think they still produced very good art, meaningful art. And yes, this was a, a kind of a watershed because it had, for the first time, the big international public having to look at Chinese contemporary art before uh, it was basically ignored. Uh, this time things were different. And then, you know, the boom which led to an enormous price rise uh, until the whole art world crashed 2008. And of course you see the ups and downs of their works in the international art market. Uh, it's interesting that you who started collecting Chinese contemporary art much before everybody else now still go door hopping, shall I say, <laughs> when you come to Beijing or other parts of China to visit the artists. For me it's very important because it allows me to look into people's lives. I may not have this access as a foreigner. For me it's not so much about taking home a finished product from a gallery. Actually this process of meeting the artist, seeing the environment, discussing work, discussing thoughts uh, is the thing rather than the product. What drives you? Art is like uh, vacationing in my own mind. <laughs> <laughs> so Do you have long vacations? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, long maybe, many at least. This way it uh, triggers my thinking so it's a little like a drug in my case. So where I would be you know, I would have an interest. What are the artists of that space doing? It doesn't really matter to me whether a 12-year-old girl or an 80-year-old woman made the artwork. What matters is the creativity that went into making. The Many say Chinese artists have this luxury that other artists probably in the rest of the world could hardly have, which is a dramatic change in society, a lot of pressure, a lot of contrast, conflicts, challenges, opportunities, personal experiences, all at the same time, explosion of things. Do you think that's true? I think that's true. Uh, it may sound a bit cynical even, you know, that big tensions in a society and uh, big ruptures and speed and uh, uh, fast, fast development and uh, you know, urbanization on such a scale. Many experiments, as China does, no one ever did. Uh, this is conducive to create art for an artist. Uh, in, the, in the Western world, in many situations, many countries, you know, the artists don't have such a resource. Mm -hmm. So uh, they may dwell more on like, formal issues, etc. Also fine, but uh, I think the very specific situation of China uh, leads to a, a, a 
quite an interesting art creation. How much artists will still be able to reflect in their works what's going on in their real life, the context of their real life? Uh, maybe today's art scene is not political as it was in the 80s or 90s, uh, because life's you know developed differently in China. People now have uh, other priorities, and there are issues like you know, consumism, issues like identity, uh, yes, uh, ur urbanization. Uh, so these issues may not directly appear so political. But it doesn't mean the tension could be less, it doesn't mean there are conflicts. Uh, it doesn't could mean be that, less. it doesn't mean that. Also, uh, today's art world is uh, very often less about, you know, a very impactful direct message. Artists prefer to be ambiguous and, and open up a space so the viewer, you know, will fill that space somehow. So. Uh, the art goes somewhere else than from being very placative and direct. Do you think Chinese these days like Chinese contemporary art? Uh, it's still a small segment of Chinese society. Explain, please. Looking at it, because contemporary art is made according to a very different paradigm than the traditional art. Of course, everyone familiar with traditional art, where you develop the tradition you built on whatever there is and it's about beauty, it's about harmony. Uh, contemporary art made to a very different paradigm. Contemporary art very often does away with everything there is and you know starts on the green field yeah. and uh, beauty may be there but is not important and it is more reflecting on society. It's also being critical about society and it depicts the world as it is, not as it ought to be, you know, like the tradition very often did. That's a big difference, and not everyone can follow that spirit, or it takes exposure. If you can't see the contemporary art, if you don't see it, then well, how could you understand it? How would you collect it? So that spiral, you know, first has to start to turn then the interest for contemporary art grows. And, uh, and we, we are somewhere there. But then there is also now more and more access to international art. So all of a sudden, many Chinese collectors who in the past only looked at Chinese art, now look at international art. <laughs>
it was like ink on paper as a medium and, and what we call modern art. Uh, that's what the Chinese know best. Then, of course, with the revolution came revolutionary art and particularly on the Chairman Mao uh, who took a liking to socialist realism he had discovered for himself in the Soviet Union at the time. He brought uh, the professors here and they taught in the Chinese art academies oil painting, socialist realism. That art had to serve a purpose. It had to educate the masses. Then once the Mao era came to an end and the open up, you know, really took a hold, uh, art for the first time became autonomous art. It was actually the artist decide what to do, what not to do. And uh, that new autonomy created what we now call contemporary art. And how is it likely to be developed in the near future? What's the thing that you're reading from your interaction with the artists? Uh, I see mainly two directions. One is many artists want to go into this global mainstream art. What does that mean? Global mainstream art, you know, this is the art we see all over the world look ever more alike, in fact. Uh, and uh, it's what uh, also the market now is dominating, the big auctions. And then you have this other uh, direction where the Chinese artists, after having tried, you know, this global mainstream art and being somewhat disillusioned about it, turn to their own tradition again, which they neglected for long, with some exceptions. So, you mean in my view, this ink and watercolor paintings. Yeah, yeah, and the tradition and w what it represents in terms of uh, thought as well. So. Uh, I think this is also a very interesting strategy because today you have to create your art by difference, uh, even in this global mainstream art. Uh, and you know, why not dig into your own resource, which is the Chinese culture? It's a very rich resource. Are the Chinese artists keep on thinking? Uh, some yes, some a little bit less. <laughs> uh, but you know, this is a global phenomenon. Not every artist is a genius and. You can't cut off your ear every day like at Van Gogh did. He also, also only cut it off one time, right? Physique has a subtle demeanor, even in a television interview. But that will not conceal the nature of his wild heart. Luckily, in a way, he has found China, and China has found him too. He has got to know many Chinese and nurtured those friendships. But as a bridge builder, Willie Sik is not only bringing China to the world, but also the other way around. Over the decades, he has brought movers and shakers from other parts of the world to China at various critical moments of the country. For example, his friends Herzog and Demerol, who were the architects of the bird nest the official stadium of the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. Herzog Dumeron, the Swiss architect, to make this project of the bird's nest in China. Uh, what was it like compared to your, you know, ambassadorial ship in China and art collecting for experiences, business? What was it like? Well, it was a new experience in a way. They approached me because they uh, were interested to go to China do something in China, you know, build something interesting. And uh, they asked me, how do we go about that? I said, then we must do a trip together, which we did. 
and that's you know how we came to the project of the bird's nest mm -hmm. and I brought them together with uh, architects and, and other people to uh, make sure it's not going to be just a western solitaire put into China but to construct a building to which the Chinese people can relate to uh, and allude to of course not copy something Chinese would be very boring mm. but uh, yeah bring in something the Chinese people will love I think it happened <laughs> it did <laughs> when you were standing there in the stadium watching as an onlooker 40s plus some degrees under the roof of the state. At the opening ceremony. And day, uh, we yes. were sitting, I took them around myself, uh, you know. And uh, yes, uh, it was kind of exhilarating feeling because <laughs> you can't do that every day, right, to, to be involved in such a project. The 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, National Day, big celebration. What is your best wishes for this country and people who coexist with this country? Of course, I congratulate China for 70 years anniversary and uh, I hope there is so much more to come as in the past. Personally, I'm convinced I have the full confidence in the Chinese people that they will shape their future very positively. That's really my major, major wish for China. That's my talk with Willy Sika, who has lived his life through interactions with China. He has somewhat defined by this relationship. He has contradictions as a person, while at heart it a soft talker, an explorer, but basking in the serenity that China could offer. He's also a mirror for the country. The country is also a world for him. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTN, into your search engine, or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching, and tune in again tomorrow. We'll continue our special series, Inside China, celebrating the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. I'm Tian Wei. Bye.